This is a compliment to my video on the ultrasound guided femoral nerve block, in which I'm going to discuss my take on the ultrasound guided fascia iliaca block. Full disclosure, this very much represents my personal opinion and may be controversial to some. Towards the end, I will briefly discuss considerations to be taken into account when considering regional anesthesia for painful conditions of the hip. In my opinion, the ultrasound-guided fascia iliaca block is best performed as an out-of-plane, high-volume ultrasound-guided femoral nerve block. To understand this, we need to start by looking back at the development and evolution of the fascia iliaca block. Historically, the fascia iliaca block was first described by Bernard Dalens in 1989 as a safe and simple way to produce effects similar to a 3-in-1 femoral nerve block if you did not have a nerve stimulator, the skills to use one, or were concerned about the risks, especially nerve injury. The key principles of the fascia iliaca block were to first mark a needle insertion point well away from the femoral nerve, which was paradoxically the target of interest, but also the area of concern to be avoided. This insertion point was just inferior to the inguinal ligament at the junction of its lateral and middle thirds. Secondly, to have a tactile endpoint based on the pop through the fascia iliaca. In theory, this is the third distinct pop after skin and fascia lata, but needless to say, this can be more difficult than it sounds. Third, the fact that the needle is now some distance away from the femoral nerve calls for a large volume of local anesthetic to be injected in a cranial direction to try and achieve proximal spread to the femoral nerve, lateral cutaneous nerve, and obturator nerve. Dalens further recommended caudal compression during injection and post-injection massage to help achieve this. As an aside, if this concept of injection away from the actual target of interest for simplicity and safety and relying on passive spread of local anesthetic for efficacy sounds familiar to some of you, it may be because the principles involved are essentially the same ones underlying the ultrasound-guided ESP block as an alternative to the thoracic paravertebral block. It took several years before the fascia iliaca block found its way to adult practice, and it initially was used primarily in knee surgery as an alternative to nerve stimulator-guided femoral nerve blocks. In fact, it was not until the early 2000s that the fascia iliaca block was used in femoral fractures, and because of its simplicity and safety, was quickly embraced for hip fracture analgesia. From here, it was a natural progression to its application to post-operative analgesia in hip surgery, and the fascia iliaca block is now more or less synonymous with analgesia of the hip. Not surprisingly, the use of ultrasound guidance improved the success rate of the original landmark guided fascia iliaca block technique. However, if you think about it, now that ultrasound has become ubiquitous, the original impetus for the fascia iliaca block no longer applies. As I have described in another video, the femoral nerve is easily located and blocked with minimal risk using ultrasound guidance, and successful anesthesia is virtually guaranteed. I personally prefer to do a femoral nerve block rather than a true fascia iliaca block for hip analgesia because A, the femoral nerve is the main therapeutic target of interest, so why not deposit local anesthetic directly around it? And B, I personally find it much easier to enter the plane under fascia iliaca next to the femoral nerve as there is much more of a potential space. More laterally, it can be tricky to avoid injecting either too superficially above the fascia iliaca or too deep within the iliopsoas muscle. The critical element of the fascia iliaca block that I retain, however, is to use an out-of-plane approach so that I am injecting in a cranial direction and thus promoting spread to the proximal articular branches of the femoral nerve that supply the hip joint, and hopefully also to the lateral femoral cutaneous and obturator nerves. Similarly, I will also use a larger volume of 30 to 40 milliliters as long as the maximum recommended dose of local anesthetic is not exceeded. Another important modification that I have adopted is to use a hybrid out-of-plane, in-plane visualization approach. This was inspired by Dr. Peter Hebert's description of his superinguinal fascia iliaca block, in which he places the probe longitudinally, obtains an in-plane view of his needle, 
and advances it cranially into the pelvis under direct vision. I will now describe how I perform this technique. Start by imaging and identifying the femoral nerve in transverse cross-section close to the inguinal ligament. This is described in detail in my video on the femoral nerve block, so I will not elaborate further here. Enter the femoral nerve compartment under fascia iliaca, just next to the lateral corner of the nerve, using an out-of-plane approach at a 45-degree angle. Correct needle tip position is confirmed by the expected expansile spread pattern next to the nerve. I inject approximately 10 milliliters to open up the fascial compartment adequately. At this point, the probe is rotated 90 degrees to obtain a longitudinal view of the needle and its tip within the subfascial lake of local anesthetic. The iliopsoas muscle is visible deep to the hypoechoic fluid. The needle tip can now be advanced further cephalad into a supraingrinal location proximal to the inguinal ligament. I usually continue to inject local anesthetic as I advance the needle to open up the space and to observe that the local anesthetic is indeed spreading in a cranial direction over the muscle and into the pelvis. A catheter may also be easily placed using this technique. Once the initial loading bolus of local anesthetic has been delivered through the needle, a catheter may be advanced without difficulty 5 to 6 centimeters beyond the needle tip. Alternatively, you can use a catheter over needle set. I have begun to favor this set as it is almost as simple to perform as a single injection block and in my experience can be easily done at the bedside in the emergency department or in the ward. With the out-of-plane approach just described, the entire length of catheter can be inserted into the fascia iliaca compartment alongside the nerve, minimizing the risk of malposition and dislodgement. For those of you still weighing whether to perform a fascia iliaca block or not, there are a couple of other things to consider. First of all, what is the pain condition that you are trying to treat? At present, fascia iliaca blocks are done almost exclusively for painful conditions of the hip, ranging from hip fracture to hip arthroplasty or even hip arthroscopy. Second, where is this pain actually coming from? As with almost any area of the body, pain may be originating from injury to skin and cutaneous structures, muscles and ligaments, joints or bone. This will be different for different conditions and also in different phases of patient care. In hip fracture, for example, the preoperative pain is primarily from the bony fracture and from associated muscle trauma and spasm. The reduced muscle mass in elderly patients is one reason they are often not in much pain if they are immobilized compared to younger patients. Now, following surgery, however, bone pain is no longer a major factor and instead pain comes from surgical trauma to muscle and skin. And this will depend on exactly what kind of operation is performed. Is it a dynamic hip screw, a bipolar hemiarthroplasty, or an intramedullary nail? The importance of knowing the details of the actual surgery being performed was highlighted in this study, which correlated skin innervation with the different incisions for hip surgery. Note that the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve only innervates the area below the greater trochanter, and the area superior to that is innervated by the iliohypogastric nerve and the subcostal nerve of T12. The area posterior to this is innervated by the dorsal rami of L1 and L2. This means that covering T12 and L1 may be quite important for postoperative analgesia of the hip. Treating pain after hip arthroscopy is an even more complex issue as there can be multiple sources of pain, not all of which can be addressed with a single regional anesthesia technique. In a nutshell, while there is no single block technique that will provide complete hip analgesia for every scenario, the biggest bang for your buck will likely come from getting local anesthesia into the supraingrinal area close to the lumbar plexus and all its terminal branches. The original fascia iliaca block and the out-of-plane femoral block that I have described 
are infrainguinal approaches to achieving this supraingual spread. This is why, although a transverse in-plane infrainguinal approach is often described, with all due respect to my colleagues at NISORA and elsewhere, I do not see a good reason to use it. While it may block the femoral nerve at the level of injection, this may not be as effective as an actual in-plane femoral nerve block. And more importantly, it will probably not achieve the desired supraingual spread of local anesthetic, which is critical for achieving good analgesia of the hip. Instead, for those of you that would still prefer to perform a true ultrasound-guided fascia iliaca block away from the femoral nerve, I recommend starting with the longitudinal in-plane supraingual approach that was first described by Peter Hebbard. There are a couple of excellent videos available on YouTube, which I have also linked to in the description, and I recommend that you watch these for more information. In brief though, the probe is placed over the anterior superior iliac spine to start, and is slid medially along the inguinal ligament until the bow tie sign is obtained, where the knot of the bow tie is the inguinal ligament, and the bows are the sartorius and internal oblique muscle lying on top of iliopsoas or iliacus muscle. The needle is inserted in plane to pierce fascia iliaca and produce superinguinal local anesthetic spread that tracks cranially over iliopsoas. A second more recently described variant of the superinguinal fascia iliaca block involves probe placement and needle insertion above the inguinal ligament. Here we are performing a direct superinguinal injection under the fascia overlying the iliacus muscle in the pelvis which may even spread distally around the femoral nerve. There is currently relatively little literature on it and no good online resources that I could find, but in principle this may be a good approach for hip analgesia as it may even reach the higher branches of the lumbar plexus such as the iliohypogastric nerve. To end, I think that the discussion around fascia iliaca blocks highlights a few important issues. First, always consider exactly what is the pain condition that we are treating and as a result, what are the nerve targets that are important? Is an indirect technique such as the fascia iliaca block the best choice? Perhaps for reasons of simplicity, safety, concerns regarding equipment required or skill level, or recognizing that there may be a trade-off in terms of efficacy. For example, if the femoral nerve is the primary target, perhaps just performing a femoral nerve block may be best. When it comes specifically to hip surgery, Supraingual spread of local anesthetic is critical, and this was the rationale behind the development of the original fascia iliaca block. As modifications have evolved over the years, we must appreciate the nuanced differences between the described approaches out there and choose the correct one. As always, thanks for watching, and don't forget to check out the other related regional anesthesia videos in this channel.